First off, Lisa, thank you so much for the intro. And I'd love to say thank you to our host, SDI, tonight. Uh, you've been wonderful to work with, uh, with Catapult, and both with Ron, myself, and Carla. And I just want to say kudos to SDI. And again, I know this is the end of maybe many people's work week. Many are working tomorrow. Uh, Thursdays can be a great night off. And here you are sharing your night with us. And from Catapult Education, I just want to say we're very appreciative of your support. So I'm going to say formally a good evening to everyone. And this is really a part two course. And what I would say is a very, very hot subject, the role of silver diamine fluoride in our practices. In part one of this series, which is still on, uh, I believe we have a recording on that, we had five presenters and they were from all over the globe and two of those presenters are returning tonight. They're Carla Cohn and Ron Kaminer. Both are general dentists with the caveat being Carla's practice is 100% devoted to children. And what I learned tonight is she does all her consults in her office and she only does OR dentistry now for her kids where Ron sees and annoys patients of all ages. As a general dentist myself, I love you, Ron, I see SDF truly expanding in indications because what we're seeing as the continuing trend is, how do we save tooth structure and save pulps? And I, I think this is a fascinating topic and, and I really feel it involves patients of all ages and that's why Ron and Carla are on tonight. And SDF's role will continue to expand in our practices. This is not a quick flyby, not at all. SDI has spent countless years doing their research, both in laboratory and clinically, to both demonstrate both the safety of the product and equally the efficacy of its use clinically. And in my practice, I just imagine a 25-year-old with asymptomatic deep occlusal decay and there you are and you've exposed the pulp on a 25 or 30 year old. And that's the stuff we want to avoid today. Because you truly have to ask yourself on an asymptomatic patient, was it really necessary? And now that you can potentially really resolve all these issues over time, meaning why expose these pulps? So I, I will just say that this is where SDF becomes so critical. In my world, because I've been in practice 35 years, many of my 50 and 60 year olds have become my geriatric patients. And what we're seeing, of course, is rampant gingival decay. And when you see that 93 year old patient in your practice and not in great health, and there you are, and you wanted to save their teeth. You really want to drill very little. You want to take out the superficial soft carries, and then you want to do reparative dentistry. That's what tonight's really all about. From really just infancy to really geriatric dentistry, we have two great clinicians talking tonight and presenting tonight. I have no doubt tonight's course will be beneficial for everyone who's listening in. I want you to shoot us questions. Last time we did this, we had over 200 questions. We ran late, but we wanted to get to everybody's questions. I'll be asking each speaker after they present a few questions. And then I'll also be doing a final Q&A after Carla's present presentation. At this point, I'm gonna say, Ron, come on the screen, unmute yourself, which is something I really don't like to say. And uh, it's just great having you here. Let's wow them, let's teach them, let's share with them everything we can. I'll see you in a few minutes. Thanks, Lou, and thanks for the uh... I'll say warm, kind words. For those that don't know, Lou and I are like besties. So we kind of take little ribs or digs at each other and things like that, all in love and everything else because we're just really so close. And, um, you know, tonight what we're going to do is Carl and I are going to really um, just discuss, you know, the rationale and guide to using silver fluoride in the practice. And to set you guys up for the evening, what I try to do and what I'm leading off is for those that are newbies when it comes to silver fluoride, I know for, for at least for myself, I want, if I'm going to try something new, if I'm going to try something on patients, 
I think we've heard and I've heard for many years, I want evidence-based. I'm just not going to try something unless I have some science behind it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set you guys up with a bunch of science because Lou said, you're going to lead off and you're going to bore them with the science. I'm like, okay, I'll do that. I'm going to show some clinical cases and then a video at the end, uh, how to implement silver fluoride or SDI silver fluoride on a type of dot. Then I'm going to pass the baton back to Lou, who is going to talk for a little bit with some nonsense. And then we're going to pass the baton back to Carla and she's going to continue the conversation and focus on pediatric dentistry. And the goal is tonight that you're going to have a totally well-rounded evening and really get ready to use uh, silver fluoride or Reva Star in your practice. So here's a little shameless plug. I'd like for anyone on Instagram to friend me at Vino Dentino. So that's where I talk about some new innovations in dentistry as well. Mostly I talk about is some great fine wine, Napa wines and some other wines. So friend me at Vino Dentino. And uh, you can also DM me there. If you have any questions at the end of the program, you can DM me there as well. So I'll leave this for a second. So you can screenshot this or take a picture and you can DM me any questions if we don't get to your questions here at the end of the night. I want to thank SDI for, for sponsoring this program. And I, and I think it's, as Lou said, and, you know, Lou, you know, we're similar. And he, he, you know, he hated to pass the mic and I hate to acknowledge for some of the things that he said, but, you know, silver fluoride is really important. And this topic is a hot topic and super, super important in dentistry. And that's why we spent the time to do not one, but two of these programs where you can learn about silver fluoride. It is really one of the hottest topics out there. And I think in regards to minimally invasive dentistry, which I've been preaching for many, many years, I think silver fluoride right now is the hottest topic as we talk about minimally invasive dentistry. The interesting thing is it's not something that's very new. So silver fluoride has been around since ancient, you know, Japanese cultural times. And back then it was used more uh, as a dye to dye teeth black. And when they did that, they found that it also reduced tooth decay. So it's nothing, this is nothing new. It's been around for many years, but it's been reused and reinvented now because we've transitioned in dentistry. And we've gone from the GV black times of extension for prevention and convenience form and, and all that kind of stuff to now doing as little as possible, but preserving as much tooth structure as possible. So silver fluoride has been cooking for many, many years. And we always knew from the early studies that silver fluoride had an anti-caries effect. One of the things that we figured out early on, which was what held this product back was that true silver diamine fluoride caused black staining of the tooth. And that came from the reduction of silver ions to metallic silver and silver oxide and absorbed by the tooth itself. So we know that today that true silver fluoride will only stain defects in the tooth structure. Things like carious lesions, restorative margins, things like that will get stained. But sound tooth structure will not be stained by traditional silver fluoride. Now, if you look at this pediatric patient, this is not my case, but this is an example of a pediatric patient in an underserved community that you can see there's no infections on the tissue here. So there's, these teeth are not uh, infected. So you have in theory live pulps, but they've been treated with silver fluoride. And if you were to take your explorer and run it against that dentin, it would scrape like hard tooth structure. Because one of the advantages of silver fluoride, again, as you'll see, is it basically petrifies the tooth. It makes things just hard. And when we look at the patient populations who can benefit from silver fluoride, you start to realize that it's not just the kids. Carl is gonna focus on kids. I'll talk about some adults, but to give you a little summation on who can benefit from silver fluoride, first of all, these are patients who are at a high risk from dental caries. 
People with numerous carious lesions, they can't be treated in a single visit. So you may have someone, you know, Lou told you today that Carla takes kids to the OR now. So she's going to do a lot in a single visit. I treat kids in the office, but what if I can't do everything in one visit? And I tackle the right side, but the left side's still hurting them. Well, I could treat that left side with silver fluoride to abate or slow down the process until I can get to it for full definitive care. Now, you may have patients that are behaviorally or medically challenged. So I used to take kids to the OR. As I told Carla, I was trained by a pediatric dentist, but I'm a GP. I don't do it anymore. But if I have kids who are behaviorally or medically challenged, I can treat with silver fluoride and again, stop or slow the process down. Now, silver fluoride works really, really well in underserved populations. So patients without access to proper dental care could be in government clinics or in community clinics, or maybe an Indian reservation where there's not, there may not be the right access to care. So it'll work well in that to slow down the process or to arrest decay. Uh, it could be young kids waiting for hospital-based dental treatment. So Carla can talk more about this, but maybe she's, Carla's busy. So maybe she's got a month wait to treat her kids with someone's hurting. So she might wanna treat that child in the office, possibly real quickly to slow the process down. Um, and you know it'll also work well for non-invasive treatment on teeth that are ready to come out. So tooth's kind of getting a little bit loose, there's decay, you don't wanna go ahead and drill into it. Great, treat it with silver fluoride. I had one of those today in the office. And the other thing where it works really, really well is people who report pain from dentin hypersensitivity. Because one of the things that you'll see about silver fluoride is a great desensitizer when used properly. Who don't I want to use it on? Well, anybody who is allergic to heavy metals. If you have severe soft tissue inflammation or ulceration, and the reason is that Riva Star, as it currently exists, has a very high pH, and it could be, if it got on the tissue, it could irritate the soft tissue. We'll talk about that, how we protect the soft tissue. You don't want to use it on pregnant or lactating women just because you don't want to do much of anything on those people. Um, but the truth is adverse reactions to silver fluoride are very rare. And if it does come in contact with soft tissue, you might get a little burn like you would in a bleaching visit, but it'll go away pretty rapidly. Sorry, I needed a sip of my wine. So what do we know about the research as we delve into it? Studies show that silver diamine fluoride and silver fluoride can and will inhibit the progression of decay. Enamel and dentin are harder and less soluble after the application of silver diamine fluoride. Now, again, if you look here, this is nothing new. This is a 20 year study. If you actually look at the teeth histologically, what you'll see is a significant remineralization through odontoblastic activity. Again, the facts, what we know, silver fluoride will inactivate and destroy plaque bacteria. It'll mechanically seal carious and sound detinotubules. Silver and fluoride will work together to form fluorapatite, which will strengthen the tooth structure. And we'll be able to decrease sensitivity dramatically. These are the facts that we know when it comes to silver fluoride. We're gonna to focus tonight and talk about Riva Star, which is SDI, Southern Dental Industries Silver Fluoride. It is not the only one on the market. And Advantage Arrest is a name you may know. It's a great product, it's a silver diamond fluoride. It works as claimed, but it will turn teeth black. What you will learn in a few minutes is that Riva Star SDI's silver fluoride will do everything that a true silver fluoride product can do and maybe better, but will not turn teeth black because of the chemistry. So let's get it really clear. So Riva Star silver diamond fluoride is FDA approved um, as to treat, you know, to, as a desensitizing agent to treat sensitivity. You're not going to see anywhere in the, in the literature that it's approved as an anti-caries agent, even though we know it works. So it is cleared by the FDA as a dental hypersensitivity varnish, and it does very well for that. So I want to be very clear that Carla and I are going to show you 
clinical cases where you'll see little to no sensitivity, but over time, you'll also see remineralization, which is the bonus of using this product. Reva Star comes in two bottles, but also comes in this unique delivery, the silver ampule. And, and, and really, it comes in a way that I would call it's dentist proof. I can't make a mistake. The silver ampule is silver fluoride. The green ampule is potassium iodide. The potassium iodide is a secondary application of chemistry that will neutralize the dark staining of teeth. You will have no deleterious effect on the workings of the silver fluoride, but it will eliminate or substantially reduce the dark staining of teeth. So this procedure or this, uh, or the way this is applied is patented by SDI. So by applying potassium iodide over the silver fluoride, you get a silver iodine precipitate and when you work through that and rinse it off, you'll eliminate the dark staining as you'll see. Now, whenever we use silver fluoride in a restorative fashion, we want the first layer of restorative to be some form of a glass ionomer, either a resin modified glass ionomer or a, or a true glass ionomer. That's what we want right on there because we need that layer that will chemically bond to enamel and dentin. So SDI's Riva is the perfect choice to put over Riva Star. Issue falls is that in the United States, most of us in most clinical situations will want greater aesthetics or a composite as a final restorative. So we're going to talk about a technique where we're going to use Riva Star, that's silver fluoride, a layer of glass ionomer, and then an adhesive protocol on top. So you still have an outstanding aesthetic restoration. So some more things that you have to know before we get into the clinicals. First of all, if you apply Riva Star to carrier's dentin, you may not get that kind of stain immediately. But it will eventually stain due to the sulfur being deposited into the dentin. Now, carious dentin will not stain with Riva Star if the decayed surface has been correctly prepared. If you prepare it properly, meaning removing all the mush, all the soft stuff, leaving just that leathery, brownish dentin, and place a glass ionomer over it, as you'll see in my clinicals, you will not see staining. So here's your technique, and I'll show you it in video, and Carla will as well, but it's important that we go through it over and over so you kind of get it. You want to remove all the soft carries with an excavator whenever you can in the restorative technique. I want to etch, total etch, for five seconds and wash and dry. I'm then going to apply the gray capsule, the Riva Star Silver Diamond Fluoride. And I'm going to saturate that dentin with multiple coats. Then I'll immediately apply the green capsule, the potassium iodide. And the minute I apply it onto the silver fluoride, what I'll see is this precipitate forming. The best way for me to describe it, as you'll see it in my pictures and video in, in pictures, is you'll see this dicalish off-white precipitate forming. If you continue to apply that potassium iodide, meaning just bathe it in the potassium iodide, that precipitate will disappear and it'll become clear again. When it becomes clear again, you want to immediately wash the surface and dry it and then apply glass ionomer right onto that dentin. Let that set and then go through your adhesive protocol or if you're going to just finish with a glass ionomer, just bulk fill the preparation with glass ionomer, let it set, and then pop, carve it, the occlusal anatomy, and polish. Carl's going to spend some time on this, but I think it's important to touch upon. Should we or shouldn't we take all the carries out? And, you know, we've taught, we're taught, get it all out. 
I used to have an instructor in dental school by the name of Tom Potts. He used to, if there was stain in the tooth, he used to say, Ron, get the stain out. That's, that's what he used to stay in that deep voice. And we know today that our philosophy is different. So when we focus on this study that was done only a few years ago, and they compared partial and complete caries removal and using the parameters of success as absence of signs and symptoms of irreversible pulpitis and absence of periapical alterations, what they found was that after 18 months, the success rate of complete caries removal and partial caries removal were very similar and did not differ significantly. So if you have that patient with deep caries and you're thinking, well, I'm gonna expose the pulp, they may not have money for the endo. Can you feel confident to place Riva Star and then a restoration? Well, the studies tell you that you should feel pretty confident. Do you have to tell the patient? Absolutely but the science allows you to do it with some confidence. The studies also tell us that silver fluoride has an antibacterial effect against cariogenic organisms. So by, do, by, by placing that silver fluoride on the potential carious dentin, it is gonna kill the bugs underneath or arrest the decay. Now, we know that it's not just a surface treatment. Again, a 2015 study showed that the silver diamine fluoride potassium iodide product, which is Riva Star, was effective in reducing the number of strep mutants in the detinal tubules that were infected with the organism. So we know with this application that you're actually getting penetration of Riva star into the dental tubules. And we also know that if you use silver fluoride, that you're gonna get a stronger, more protected dentin and minimize recurrent decay. I know I'm killing you with the science, but this is evidence-based. So when you start reading the dental journals, I call them the the info journals, not the unscientific ones, and they talk about the other silver fluoride products, you might read some product bashing. Product bashing of Riva Star, it's not as good as some of the other ones. Well, this is why I focus on studies that actually focus on Riva Star, that the combination of silver fluoride and potassium iodide was associated with the most fav favorable clinical outcomes in terms of caries arrest and lesion color. So you're not giving up anything by using the secondary product or the secondary application of the potassium iodide in regards to effectivity of the silver fluoride. Here's what the kit kind of looks like. And, you, and now it's available in bottles as well. I like these ampules because I break the foil, silver brush, silver ampule. This is perfect. You know. I, I, I actually read instructions, but there are some dentists like Lou Graham that need color coordination, and that's okay. Lou's a great dentist, but the colors really help him. So it's silver brush, silver fluoride, green brush, potassium iodide. That was a joke, by the way. Um, go to Total Eps to Denton in our clinicals um, to mit for five seconds, rinse it off. Now we're going to go ahead and burst the foil and apply the first application of um, Riva Star, which is the silver, followed by the potassium iodide. So that was the potassium iodide, excuse me. Prior, that was the silver. Immediately, this was a special needs patient. We're going to apply Riva, glass ionomer. We're going to carve those restorations. We're going to polish this. This is a patient who really had a hard time staying open. Uh, it was an at one. It was a Asperger's patient who was not so high functioning. They were talking all the time uh, and moisture uh, tolerant was a little bit of a problem here. So we did this as a pure glass onomer restoration. And uh, it was a young child and hoping when the, when the child is older that we'll be able to go ahead and get to a, 
and take some of this out and maybe get to a composite restoration. But what happens if you want to use a composite? So the first thing that I asked SDI years ago was, is the silver fluoride or is the silver fluoride potassium iodide going to change or inhibit my bond strength? This is a study done at the University of Texas. And it was important because they wanted to investigate the effect of the karyostatic and preventive agent silver fluoride on the microtensile bond strength of resin composite dentin. And what they found was that silver diamond fluoride does not adversely affect the bond strength of the resin composite to non carious dentin. Because what's gonna happen is, even if you place a glass ionomer on the floor, you may have lateral walls that you've not placed a glass ionomer on that you wanna now go through an adhesive process and you wanna make sure the bond strengths are gonna be strong enough. So this is Corey. Corey came to me and complained that she went to a dentist who placed eight composite restorations on her first and second molars and the teeth were killing her. And then he took them out and he placed amalgams. Why, I don't know. Not the prettiest amalgams in the world either. Um, and they were still killing her. And I was fortunate enough to be using and testing Riva Star uh, about five, six years ago, when it was first uh, submitted to the FDA. And this was done about five, six years ago. So I have a little bit of longevity on this case. And I said to her at the time, I'm testing a product for a company. You need to sign this consent, but I think I can reduce or eliminate your sensitivity. She says, whatever you got to do, do it. So we removed the amalgams. We total etched for five seconds and rinsed it off. We then applied Riva Star, the silver fluoride in the silver foil. We follow that up with the potassium iodide. Now look what happens. The minute you apply the potassium iodide, you get this dical-like reaction here on the dentin. That's that milky precipitate. Go back to the second molar, you're gonna see that if you continually apply the potassium iodide, this will revert back to this clear color. And I stopped because I wanted you to see, here's two spots I need to continue to apply the potassium iodide. So if I continue to apply the potassium iodide, this will totally be clear. Once it's clear, I'll take my air water syringe and rinse it off for three to five seconds. Now I'll dry it. I will place my glass ionomer on there. If you get it on the soft tissue like I did, you will get a chemical burn that will go away. You wanna try not to get it on the soft tissue. Then you apply a first layer of glass ionomer and let it set. Then you can go through a full adhesive process. I'll re-etch my enamel, selective etch my enamel. I may etch the whole thing. You could etch the glass ionomer if you want and then apply your composite on top. And at the time this was done with sonic fill. So what's the important takeaway here? We don't, we use silver fluoride, but we do not see any discoloration of the tooth structure. Remember, that everybody claims that silver fluoride will discolor tooth structure, but these look pretty nice. And this was an immediate post-op. Now notice here in what I would call a partial caries removal case, you could see that I have partially removed the decay. You have this leathery dentin. I selectively etched and then applied etch to the dentin. So I selected etched here for 10, then applied etch to the dentin for five and rinsed it off. That's what it kind of looks like after it's rinsed off. And I dried it purposely so you can see that frosty kind of look to it. But look what happens. I place silver fluoride. You see it kind of got darker a little bit because I have that, some caries left in there. I apply the potassium iodide and you can really see that some black spots or dark spots starting to form here. I rinse it off. I place, you can see it's gotten darker here and here and even here. I place my GIC. This is Riva. 
So it's glass polymer placed right at the base of that restoration. And then I follow that up with an adhesive protocol and composite. And you still don't see any staining, maybe a hair right over here. But for the most part, you do not see any staining in this restoration. This is the advantage of Riva Star. So keep in mind that every other silver fluoride, you would have seen black dentin and the chance of show through would have been very, very high. With Riva Star, you're typically not gonna see this. And, I've, and, th and now I will tell you that this case is about eight months old, no sensitivity. The other case that I showed you with the amalgams is five years. And she was asymptomatic immediately after the procedure. I changed all her amalgams back to composite and she had absolutely no sensitivity. Her barometer was that she could eat ice cream on those teeth and she didn't have lingering cold sensitivity. So let me take you through the video now. We will see it on the type of that. What you won't see in this video is you will not see the dent discoloration or the precipitate forming. And the reason is it's on a type of that. So you have to imagine that in your mind's eye, but it's gonna take you through an adhesive protocol if you wanna use Riva Star, followed by a glass atomer. And in this case, I put a product called Aura Flow, which is SDI's flowable, over the glass atomer, once I went through the adhesive protocol, followed by Aura, and you'll get to see it step by step. My name is Ron Kaminer, and today I'm gonna to talk to you about Riva Star and how to use it clinically in a restorative technique. Riva Star is a silver fluoride product, and for years, silver fluoride was used for caries management dating back to 1912. It fell out of favor because silver fluoride, when it arrested decay, turned teeth black. Well, lo and behold, SDI brings to the market Riva Star, a silver fluoride with potassium iodide that minimizes the ability of teeth to turn black. Now, in other countries, very often it's used in a technique where it's placed on the dentin and then a glass sonoma restoration is placed over it. Here in the States, we want an aesthetic restoration. And because of that, I'm going to show you how to use this in an adhesive. Adhesive technique. So we're going to go here clinically, and this is our Riva Star capsules silver for the silver fluoride, green for the potassium iodide. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to total etch the preparation for a short period of time. Literally, we don't need much more than eight seconds or so, and I'm going to total etch this. I'm going to leave that on for eight to ten seconds. While that's setting, I'm going to go ahead and just have my assistant grab her suction. And I'm going to go ahead and just rinse it off. I'm going to dry it thoroughly. And now I'm going to place my silver fluoride. So I'm going to break the capsule with the back end. And I'm going to liberally apply silver fluoride onto the dent. Now, Riva Star acts as a desensitizing agent, an outstanding desensitizing agent, and that is technically what its FDA approval is for. Um, many people use silver fluoride for caries arrest and caries management, but technically, it's a desensitizing agent. So I've applied it liberally, multiple coats on the dentin, and if I were just to rinse that off and leave it alone and put a restoration on it, the restoration would turn black. What I'm going to do now is apply potassium iodide. The potassium iodide undergoes a chemical reaction with the silver fluoride, and as it undergoes a chemical reaction in the mouth, this will turn a dical-like color, almost yellowish, and I, when I keep applying it, it'll turn back clear. Obviously, here on the model, it doesn't do that, but in your mind's eye, you can figure what happens. So I'm putting multiple coats now of the potassium iodide. And once that's sufficiently coated the silver fluoride, I'm then going to rinse that off. I'm then going to rinse that off 
very, very quickly. I'm gonna suction that. And now the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna apply glass ionomer onto the dental floor. So my assistant is titrating a compule of Riva that we're gonna apply onto the dentin as the base layer. And what I'm gonna show you here is a tri-level restorative technique. So after we apply Riva, Riva Self-Cure, glass ionomer onto the dentin, I'm then gonna let that set, apply an adhesive on top, SDI zip bond, light cure that, let that set, and then apply flow and a final restorative. So we have a tri-level adhesive restoration that has silver fluoride underneath. Clinically, when I've done these, I can tell you that there's, very, there's little to no staining of that residual dentin. So I'm gonna just apply a little bit onto the dentinal floor, just like so. I'm gonna take a ball burnisher and I'm gonna wet it just with a little bit of water, not alcohol when we use glass ionomer, and I'm just gonna tamp that down right into place. And you can kind of see that as it tamps down right onto the dentin. And now we wait, we keep it dry and we let it sit. Reva will set, the fast will set pretty quickly, well under a minute. And what I'll then do is I'll go back and I'll check with my ball burnisher every so often on the consistency. I see it's still wet, but I'll press it just down into place and we let it sit. Remember, I've total etched the preparation. So my enamel margins are etched. My dent on the floor was etched. I've now dried it. The next step that I'm gonna now do, once Riva has set, is I'm gonna apply zip bond to the entire preparation, internal walls, enamel margin, and apply zip bond. So I'm gonna go ahead and take my zip bond, my glass onomer is pretty well set, and I'm gonna apply zip bond everywhere. Onto my internal walls, onto my preparations. I'm gonna apply that, really coating that dentin, really agitating it into the dentinal walls. I'm then gonna air dry it. First slowly, and then vigorously. And then I'm gonna light cure the restoration. So now we've cured our adhesive in place. I'm going to apply one layer of Aura Easy Flow. The beautiful thing about Easy Flow, it's, it's, it has great consistency to it. So I'm going to apply it right over my glass ionomer, small amount, running up to my dentinal walls. I don't even need to touch it. I'm going to light cure that as well. I'm then going to apply Aura right on top. I'm going to take just a ball burnisher here. I'm going to tamp it down into place. I have a little bit of wetting resin on there so materials don't stick on me. I'm going to remove all that excess. Trying to work around my videographer, it's always fun. Now I'd be using SDI's curing light right now, but my hygienist is placing sealants and she's using the light. But I'm just gonna go ahead and finish off this restoration. handling of that aura is really, really nice. And 
and we're just about through. I'm going to hit that now with the curing light. And if you follow this technique specifically, you will see that most of the time, almost all the time, you'll have absolutely no graying of the tooth, no discoloration, but you'll have a desensitized preparation and the silver fluoride will assist you in caries management. So that's that step-by-step -step approach in a restorative technique. But what if you do in class five? What happens if you have a real sensitive class five? So the first thing you need to do is block out the soft tissue. Either liquid rubber dim or just a real good coating of Vaseline will do as well. Uh, if they're not unbelievably sensitive and you can at least rinse and dry, I prefer to etch because you'll get deeper penetration of the silver fluoride. But if not, you still will get penetration you can just go ahead and use the silver fluoride followed by the potassium iodide. Rinse off and you should see an immediate result when it comes to desensitization. Now, what about people say, what do you charge for this or how do you charge? Well, if I'm doing desensitization, well then I'll charge a per tooth desensitization fee. $125, 100 bucks, 85 bucks, whatever you wanna charge. It doesn't take all that long to do. You can also use a desensitization code there as well. If I'm going under a restoration, I'll either bill it as an indirect pulp cap, or if they don't have coverage or anything, I will add an additional fee to the procedure, 75 to $125 per tooth. And I'll tell the patient that we are putting some medicine underneath that's gonna help not only desensitize your tooth, but prevent future decay and hopefully minimize the need for root canal. Before I pass it to Lou, I also want to tell you real quick that there are some potential future applications to silver fluoride in the anodontic space. Because this kills bacteria, there are some studies being done and were done in Europe using silver fluoride as an intracanal medicament in difficult cases in between procedures. So I think that to sum it up, that we're, not only does Revastar work well, but the uses and the potential procedures will expand over time as approvals will allow. So my goal was really to just give you the science, show you some stuff. I hope you got enough out of it. Passing it back to Lou, it's all you brother. Hey, Ron, that, that was, honestly, that was great. It kills me to say it, but that was great. So, Ron, it's interesting. So a lot of questions in, on the chats talk about one specific question, and we'll get to many more. Why do you etch before putting Revastar in? We heard this from Jeff Knight the first time in all of his research. Why do you etch? Yeah, I mean, Jeff did a ton of research on this, and Jeff is the co um inventor of this product, and just a brilliant dentist down under. And, and what they found by etching, you open up those tubules and you'll get a deeper penetration of that silver fluoride. And the goal is to get it, if when we can, to get that deep penetration and what you will see. And he showed some unbelievable radiographic studies where you can actually see the dentin remineralizing. A week after treatment, you will see total change Instead of radiolucent dentin, you will see radiopaque dentin. So again, by etching it, we're gonna get that deeper penetration and get that deeper remineralization. And it's almost mind boggling, but we do see it. So, and I agree, just wanna make sure that point is clear to everybody. And maybe the only time, as Ron said, is if someone's uber sensitive and you're doing desensitization, it's not essential to etch. So another common question, Ron, is, that came from three people. Um, why not avoid glass anomers and just put down a liner? Explain yep. to them why resins really are counterintuitive after Revastar. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so, you know, there's a whole big debate on 
when using liners, if you're using a fluoride releasing liner in a resin, how much fluoride are you actually getting out of that resin? Is it really releasing anything? Typically, most resin liners have a very, very low bond strength to dentin, probably five megapascals or less to begin with. So by placing a glass outomer, which will chemically bond to enamel and dentin, plus exert another antibacterial effect in the process, it's, it works synergistically with the silver fluoride to create this ideal restoration. So, and, and the research really has been done using a glass on them or not a liner underneath. Uh, I guess if there was a true glass on them, a liner and without resin, it'd probably be just as good. But um, for now, we're still using glass on them or, and, and trying to avoid resin in that dentin. And, and two key points, Ron, because I know you had limited time. Um, when I do this technique and I put my glass on them or down, I'm, I'm, I'm probably less perfectionistic than you in that regard. I often over bulk it and then I just re-prep it with a diamond burr to remove the excess off my cabo surfaces and lateral. So I'll just pack it and let it set and re-prep. Do you follow that technique ever? Absolutely. So, cause you know, you're going to get stuff on your margins and ideally on your occlusal, you want to bevel those cable surface margins. So you're going to go back over and just take away that, that excess. You don't need a ton of glass on them or you just want right your base layer being that glass outomer. And if it gets on the walls, we'll just take some, some away because we're going through that adhesive process. It actually takes only a few seconds to do it. So I agree, that's great. So one of the attendees asked a question and, and I think we've got to address it. And that's, that's why I love having these Q and A's after each speaker. So let's say you remove the carries and I use a Comet Cerebur really low at 1500 RPMs. I've removed the superficial decay, you knew you were near the pulp and you are really deep. And now the question is, do you put like a base liner down like a Theracal from Bisco, or if you're deep, do you go to the silver diamine fluoride? And you know what I mean, Ron, this is a challenging question because you've stopped drilling, but you knew it was deep to begin with. You, talk out the super, you took out the superficial decay is silver diamine fluoride, and I don't know this answer, contraindicated, I think it is near the pulp, and wouldn't you prefer to put a liner down and then this SDF? I'm just curious, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think if I, first of all, let's do clarity. If I have an exposure, a pinpoint exposure, for sure I'm putting Theracal on a pinpoint exposure. There's no question I'm going to do that. Uh, you know, again, Theracal's bond strength to dentin is very, 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 very low. So if I have a small deep area and I want to put the calcium hydroxide liner down, I'll put a, a hair, a dot amount. Right. But my global portion of my dentin is going to be bathed in the silver fluoride because that's where I want the penetration to go. And, and I think for everybody on this, because Ron and I are true clinicians, use like a, a, a micro brush, keep it mildly moist. Scrub your dentin if you're deep. Put a little Theracal on wet dentin, mildly moist. Let it flow, light cure, and then go to silver diamine fluoride. Right, Ron? Isn't that be your approach? Thousand percent, absolutely. Okay. okay. So, Ron, another question from Ryan came. Ron, if you're doing desensitization and you pop that little silver air, silver first, how many teeth can Rebistar desensitize in a quad? I think I know, but I'm going to ask you. It'll do three, four teeth. I mean, it, there's plenty of stuff in that ampule. It'll get a number of teeth, I think, in that, in that quadrant. You might even sneak out a whole quadrant out of it, but definitely three teeth for sure, because there's plenty of liquid in that ampule. I, I, I agree. That's, I agree. So now here's an interesting question. Gluma versus Revastar for desensitization. Now people, Dennis, we're all cheap. We know that. And that was highlighted that we're not cheap, but it's more expensive to use Revastar. I have found this to be far more effective in desensitization than anything else on the market. In my experience, Ron, what's been yours? So I think a couple of things. One, uh, it, I've never been a Gluma user per se, but I, so I can't comment on the effectiveness, but I think, you know, what you're getting with Revastar is 
that you're not getting with gluma is you're getting the remineralization. So gluma might give you the desensitization. Similar, I, I you know I've seen stuff with Reaver Star that I never think never thought would be uh, desensitized, but it works really well. But you're not going to get the remineralization. So the mechanisms are totally different. Uh, if you're looking just for desensitization and you're comfortable with gluma, a lot of people don't love the hema and the gluma. There's a lot of questions with that. Uh, and gluma is not the cheapest product per ounce if you did it by ounce. So uh, I, I think gluma is a good product. I was just never a gluma user. I think that, and this is going to sound very matter of fact and maybe obnoxious, and I don't mean it to be. I think gluma works well because many dentists, the technique and following a technique to placing a composite can be very labor intensive, doing it the right way, multiple applications of the adhesive, things like that. And Gluma will give you a belt and suspenders for that. For me using Reva Star, you know, even though it's a desensitizing agent, uh, the bonus for me is not the remineralization. The primary use is for the remineralization and the bonus is the desensitization, if that makes right. sense. And I think the fact that it's even more carries resistance it, there's just a whole lot to it. So this is this is a question from Hudson Clary from outside Chicago. And, and Hudson, this is a really good question. So Uncle Lou's going to ask him. So silver diamine fluoride, you've talked about this, but it's still asked, how many times, how much silver diamine fluoride do you apply before the potassium? So I'll put, so I, I use the philosophy like I do with dental adhesives. I put multiple coats on, two, three coats. I wanna make sure I bathe, in, bathe that dentin with the material. The same thing I do with an adhesive. And I talk about this with my associate because she gets a lot of sensitivity. And now I've, got, I've gotten her using Reva, a lot of Reva Star. And I think her sensitivity comes from not adhering to proper technique. She just puts on one coat of adhesive, thinks that's good enough and it's gonna do the trick. So I'll just put multiple coats just make sure I bathe it in there, kind of get agitated into that dentin, and I'll feel comfortable that the tooth is well covered with uh, silver fluoride. Um, okay, so Ron, if we could, and there's some questions I'm gonna wait for Carla on primary teeth, but I, I really love covering so many of these. How do you use silver diamine fluoride for subgingival root decay? I mean, this is my geriatric nightmare. Any tips and tricks? You know, so I, I, I'm going to be very honest. I think that right now, subgingival decay, when it comes to Reva Star, you have to get it away from the tissue because you're going to get that chemical burn. Uh, you can totally coat the tissue with mineral oil or Vaseline. That will protect the tissue with a light paintbrush. But I would just get underneath there and uh, get that material in there or... If I could, I would take my diode laser, remove some soft tissue, and just do a restorative procedure and get it done. Yeah, I would say for the person who asked that, and they're anonymous, I, you know, Ron and I are both big Gemini laser users from Alternet. And honestly, with an activated tip, it takes you less than five minutes. Just remove that tissue if you can. Ron, that's my approach. In this way, you know, you're kind of cleaning it. Now, you could go, obviously, you're just going to burn it otherwise. So I'd rather just remove it and get clean margins to restore to. I'm sure you do the same. Agreed. Okay. So last question, and, and this isn't from Hudson Cleary, but I do say hi to Hudson, baby. Um, from Bernardino. Um, he asks, I'm placing silver fluoride on all my crown deliveries, which is really interesting. Is there any contradiction, any contraindications with cements and silver fluoride? I think we're going to already know the answer to this, but he says, I haven't seen any problems with my crown deliveries and cementation success. It's a really great question, Ron, um, but I'm going to ask you your thoughts because it's a little bit different. So I listen, I don't do that. And I'm not, and, it, and it's a very good thought. Yeah. I'd be concerned with a pure resin cement. Right, going right at the silver fluoride. Um, I'd be less concerned with an RMGI cement because of the interaction with the 
the glass outomer portion. Now, I've not seen studies with cements yeah. and silver fluoride, and I and I probably should do a search because my guess is there's either a right or a wrong way. And just because you haven't seen a problem um, doesn't mean you won't have problems in the future, especially if you're using a self-etching resin or one of those materials. And if you're using a self-etching resin, I'm just thinking you applied the Rima star potassium iodide, and now you're going back and re-etching that material. You know, I'm not so sure the chemistries are gonna jive. Yeah, I, I, I gotta say, that's a big question mark to me too, because you're, you're going off label there. And I don't know if the studies support that. Um, if you were using a true glass ionomer cement, the answer would be fine. Correct. But, but a lot of us aren't using traditional glass ionomer. So I think the focus tonight is after silver diamine fluoride and potassium iodide, we are, we are not, not going to any type of resin. Last question, Ron. What if someone has a true allergy to iodine? Um, listen, I, I think if it's a true allergy to iodine, I don't know the actual answer, but my gut would be if they're really allergic to iodine and there's an iodide portion here, I'd refrain from using the product. I wouldn't want to own that risk in the process. I think Jeff's the right person to ask there. We can probably get him an answer for sure. I'm sure he studied that. I'm with you. Um, okay, I got to get rid of you, Ron. You were great. Go take a break. It's time for Carla. Guys, thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed. I saw a bunch of you friend me on Insta, and I think that's great. Vino Dentino. Carla, go for it, baby. Okay, I am on. Uh, thank you very much, Ron. That's a, a great presentation. Thank you for sharing everything. This is my part two of SDF and redefining dentistry. And of course, what I speak on is pediatric dentistry for the general practitioner. And uh, my contact information is up here. That's drconatshaw.ca is my email. If you have any questions you wanted to get hold of me after the presentation, feel free to reach out. Catapult Education website, of course, thank you to them. We have aapd.org, and that is the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry website, and that has a ton of information on pediatric dentistry. If you're not familiar with that, I encourage you to go to that. That's where we get all of our information and our evidence-based dentistry for pediatric dentistry. And of course, I would also love to have you all as followers of mine on Instagram, and I am Kids Dentist Carla post lots of stuff that happens in my practice and also lots of my two puppies, Lucy and Sally. So just a further word or two about my career. I have been practicing dentistry now for 30 years and I'm a clinical dentist and I am devoted solely to practicing and caring for kids. I immediately after dental school did a hospital internship in pediatric dentistry and never quite looked back from there. As of January 1st, I have now uh, limited or devoted my practice only to hospital dentistry, but uh, have no fear, I have had plenty of chairside experience with kids of all different walks of life and behavior situations throughout my career, and I have plenty of insight to share with you there. And so I wanted to share my experiences today with you, and thank you to SDI for your support for this webinar and of course for the creation of this product that we are speaking of tonight. And also a big thank you and shout out to Catapult Education. So as was mentioned, we do receive an honorarium educational grant from SDI for today's lecture. But my disclosure of course is also that I speak on behalf of many other different companies about their different products and materials and everything that I speak about I use and everything that I use I tend to speak about as well. My agenda for tonight's 45 minutes or so that I have the pleasure of your company 
I'll talk about the indications of incomplete caries removal for pediatric patients, as well as the use, of course, of caries arrest medicaments for pediatric patients, and specifically silver diamine fluoride and potassium iodide in the form of Revastar. And we'll talk about definitive aesthetic restorations after incomplete caries removal and caries rest using silver co-cure technique. And with my um, demographic of my population that I see, it is almost always on an immature permanent molar in which we're uh, restoring these teeth with a definitive aesthetic restoration and incomplete caries removal so that we do not have a pulp exposure and more about that very, very shortly. Caries arrest medicaments, as Ron had alluded to, have been around for quite some time. They are nothing new to us and as was described by uh, G.V. Black, who is the father of dentistry, um, the use of silver nitrate to arrest caries well over a hundred years ago. And there is evidence as Ron had mentioned of its use historically for more than a thousand years. And it is an effective antimicrobial. So silver nitrate as a antimicrobial and as a caries arrest agent is nothing new. And incidentally, I wonder if anybody really knows what GV stands for. So what is Dr. GV Black's full name? I, I didn't, if I did know this, I had forgotten it long ago after dental school, but in case the uh, question is burning a hole in your head, GV stands for Green Vardaman. So it's Dr. Green Vardaman Black. Anyhow, Dr. Green Vardaman Black, and there he is, wrote about the use of silver nitrate back in the pathology of hard tissues of teeth and oral diagnosis. That is uh, an old, old textbook, not one that I studied from, but almost. And he used that silver nitrate with some orange wood sticks. He talks about it back here where he has Speaking of when some decay is left or some dentin is exposed, that it should be treated with silver nitrate. So back then, an incomplete caries removal. And in order to do that, he first laid a crystal of the silver nitrate on a glass slab and he crushed it with an orange wood stick. You have that water in that orange wood stick to a point. And then of course the area turned black and that was the first use of silver nitrate. So we're not really talking about something that is very new. We are talking about something that is old that we are now using in a new manner when we speak of silver diamine fluoride and potassium iodide is of course the new twist to it. What exactly is that mechanism of silver diamine fluoride? And we use 38% silver diamine fluoride. That's a combination of silver, which is a 25% content. That is the antimicrobial. So the silver is the antimicrobial agent. 8% ammonia, that is a solvent. And of course the 5% fluoride is a remineralizing agent. The silver ion, an antimicrobial and a coagulant, will denature all of the proteins in uh, the bacteria. It will break down the cell wall and inhibit DNA replication. The coagulant, so denatures of exposed dental protein, will occlude the dental tubules. And that's why the silver diamine fluoride also acts as a desensitizing agent because of that occlusion of the dentinal tubules. Fluoride, we all are familiar with in our dental profession, will remineralize or mineralize is probably a better word. So it promotes mineralization or promotes remineralization. The fluoride ion produces hydro fluorhydroxyapatite. It will inhibit demineralization and inhibit bacteria. The usages and the indications and usages as described in the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry reference manual are to be using this product, silver fluoride, on high caries risk patients with either anterior or posterior active cavitated lesions, 
uh, on cavitated carious lesions in individuals who have behavioral or medical management challenges. So as Ron described, a child or a young adult who had come in with some medical management challenges, behavioral challenges, kids that can't sit still. We have adults that can't sit still uh, for traditional treatment that still have to have their carious lesions treated in a safe and effective manner. Patients that have multiple cavitated carious lesions that can't be treated all in one visit. So kids that come into our practice who have a lot of active caries that are perhaps waiting for that operating room date and need to be treated will come in and we can then uh, treat their carious lesions and arrest the caries difficult to treat cavitated dental carious lesions. So perhaps something that's difficult or impossible to isolate. Perhaps we have uh, a lesion that we cannot keep dry in order to restore properly. So if we can arrest the caries with a caries arrest medicament, then we are giving that patient an advantage. Patients without access to or with difficulty accessing dental care. So our patients that live in rural areas who have difficulty coming into access care and active cavitated caries lesions with no clinical signs of pulpal involvement. And this is an important point that there be no pulpal involvement. We don't want to place any of the silver fluoride directly on the pulp. It is going to react poorly with the pulpal tissue. So alternate caries management, now that's really nothing new when we talk about pediatric dentistry. We always need to think outside of the box when we're treating kids because of course our treatment is dependent upon their behavior in the chair and what it is that we can get done is very different sometimes than what it is that is ideal to be done. So alternate caries management is the treatment of carious lesions uh, traditionally will require surgical intervention. This is what we do. We drill and we fill, we place restorations, we place crowns, and we drill and we fill to remove diseased tooth structure, followed by placement of restorative mirror material to restore the form and the function of that tooth. But when we have barriers to that traditional restorative treatment, so as we spoke of behavioral issues, maybe due to young age, maybe due to limited cooperation, maybe due to the inability to access care, perhaps financial constraints, then we need to look at alternate caries management modalities. And that's when we look at plan B. So we are using our silver diamine fluoride in an off-label uh, use, as was mentioned before in the previous presentation, silver diamine fluoride is actually labeled for use as dental hypersensitivity in the United States. It is used off-label for caries treatment, but don't get too um, worried about this. That's actually the same labeling and use of fluoride varnish that we use off label for caries arrest or caries prevention. When we are looking to determine what is an appropriate off label use, we have to take into account the safety and the efficacy of the material. And so an appropriate off label use for silver diamine fluoride is for caries arrest. Now, if you are listening from Canada, you practice in Canada like I do, uh, we have a few different classifications for that same product. And as Ron had mentioned, this is used in Japan since 1970, uh, used in the United States since, 19, since 2014, um, but as I said, approved as a dental sensitivity agent, but it has been approved by Health Canada in February of 2017. And in Canada, it has been approved for caries arrest. It has a breakthrough designation, uh, therapy designation in 2016. There was a new code on dental procedures and nomenclature that allowed billing claims for off-label use of silver diamine fluoride as an interim caries arresting medicament in the United States. And it was granted FDA US breakthrough therapy designation in 2016 for that arrest of, dent of tooth decay. And it really is the only oral medicine to ever receive a breakthrough therapy designation. And this is brand new. This is the ADA guide to reporting caries preventive medicative 
application and it's a lot of words there but here's a few uh, less words for you the cdt code d1355 effective of january 1st 2021 enables documenting and reporting this preventive per tooth procedure which is really what we need in order to be able to code this properly and so d1355 is a caries preventive medicament application per tooth and this is for primary prevention or remineralization and the medicaments applied do not include topical fluoride. Let's look at some of the things that we need to be aware of when we're using silver fluoride. Now the caution here is of course, if we're just using silver fluoride alone, arrested caries will appear dark brown or black. And that is of course an aesthetic. We cannot apply silver fluoride on patients that have metal allergies because of course that would be the same as uh, applying a, a metal to any other part of their body. Um, and it is metallic or bitter tasting. So do be careful when you're applying it that you don't have your kids in your practice tasting it. If we do happen to um, be a little bit sloppy with the placement of the silver fluoride, it will temporarily stain skin and oral tissues and that should resolve within about two weeks. So SDI has come up with Revastar, which is a two-step formulation, the silver fluoride and ammonia. And the step two is the potassium iodide. And what happens is the potassium iodide use immediately after the placement of the silver fluoride will minimize the black staining. So we have either a single capsule formula and the box that you see pictured here, or we have a bottle formula and both are uh, good for different uses in our uh, patient populations. So the little pots, the silver and the silver diamine fluoride, of course, is a topical agent, arrests dental caries. It's simple to apply as a drop. There's no local anesthetic required and really no drilling required if we're just using the silver fluoride alone. The potassium iodide is also a topical agent, easy to apply with a drop, and that applied will minimize the staining that is caused by the silver fluoride. Silver, so the silver fluoride available in either the capsule or available uh, in the bottle formula. So this is the capsule. So the silver fluoride is a, a unit dose there, potassium iodide unit dose there. So I think what I was saying where we left off perhaps is that the usefulness of the bottle formulation is when we have the uh, uncooperative patient and we're simply placing silver fluoride, then the bottle formulation comes in very, very handy. Now what's ideal as was talked about earlier is if we can um, etch prior to placement of the Revastar, we're going to have a deeper penetration. And this is a slide from Dr. Jeff Knight. So the comparison versus uh, conditioning with the uh, conditioning polyacrylic acid versus the etching with the uh, phosphoric acid, we see a very deeper penetration of the Revastar into the caries dentin compared uh, to the conditioning. So we can, if possible, whenever possible, we want to, can, we want to ask, etch the tooth prior to placement of the silver fluoride. So etch it, placement of the silver fluoride. Now we'll get into some clinical cases here. And this is a deep carious lesion where we want to arrest the caries so we don't have any pulp exposure, placement of the silver, and we wanna rub that in for about 60 seconds, place the silver fluoride for that amount of time. And you can see it, it is starting to turn dark, followed immediately by placement of the potassium iodide. And you see this creamy pre precipitate uh, forming onto the surfaces and you wanna to continue to place it and rub it in until that becomes clear again. Now, sometimes when we're seeing our kids, if we have an uncooperative patient or perhaps we have a, an adult who is challenged um, uh, behaviorally 
behaviorally, medically, developmentally, perhaps all that we can get to is that silver placement. And that's why I say at the point where we're using our silver fluoride on an uncooperative patient, it would be more ideal to be using the bottle formulation than the capsule formulation, because then you can simply use a drop from the bottle and not have to uh, even open up the potassium iodide if we can't get that far. But if we can, we want to put the potassium iodide on, minimize the staining, and at this point, we'd like to place a restoration. But I want to digress for a moment because what happens if we have an, a, a, a sloppy uh, delivery of our silver fluoride? And we've all spoken about staining of the tissues, and we've spoken about staining of the oral, oral um, uh, mucosa, the lips. What happens if we get that on our counter? Well, you want to wipe it up as fast as you can before it dries using an ammonia-based cleaner such as a Windex or a Lysol wipe. And we all seem to have a lot of Lysol wipes around us these days. If it's dried, you want to use a Mr. Clean, a magic eraser uh, or, or bleach or a barkeeper's friend and comet to try and get it off. If you get it on skin, you want to use water and a salt slurry or else hydrogen peroxide and all of these things will um, help to remove the stain of the silver fluoride. And as with anything that is relatively new to our market, uh, we have a, an informed consent so that we can truly explain and have our patients understand what the use of silver diamine fluoride is and why and how, including um, any possible risks or alternatives. And this is developed, this consent form is developed by SDI and you can find that on the SDI websites website. So incomplete caries removal. Let's discuss incomplete caries removal and why we would do that and, and the benefits of the silver diamine fluoride. So incomplete caries removal from this study from INJATA from 2008. On the basis of the study cited in that review, there's substantial evidence that removal of all infected dentin and deep carious lesions is actually not required for successful carious treatment of caries treatment, provided that that restoration can seal the lesion from the oral environment effectively. Then they go on to say that before the concept is accepted, generally by dental professional, additional clinical trials may be needed. Now this is uh, almost 13 years ago and more clinical trials have definitely happened since then. And since then we have uh, here in, uh, in, in JADA that talking about when we have selective caries tissue removal, is there an increased uh, incidence of restorative failure risk in primary teeth? And the answer here is that there actually is an increased risk of experiencing restoration failure because of course we have soft dentin underneath. So the practical implications of that are that we are needing to follow our patients at a more frequent interval. However, if we have the ability to use silver fluoride and to harden that carious area underneath the restoration, we're gonna have less failure. I'm gonna come back to that in just a minute. Incomplete caries removal. And in this study in 2018, when we have more data and more uh, studies done, the conclusion is within the limitations of that study, partial caries removal techniques show high success rate, both clinically and radiographically. It's reduced the incidence of pulp exposure and preserves tooth vitality. And this is primarily why we want to do an incomplete caries removal in kids, particularly in young permanent molars. We want to reduce that incidence of pulp exposure and pre preserve the tooth vitality. If I can save a kid from having an endo on a six-year molar or a 12-year molar, we've saved that kid a whole lot more than a lot of time in the chair and that uh, health of that tooth is going to be that much better and that much stronger. 
So a couple slides ago, I showed you that there was a higher incidence of failure because of soft dentin. And this slide is showing a study that was done that the new hardness in clinically diagnosed arrested dentin caries was more than 40, whereas soft caries was below 10. So if we have the arrested dentin caries, it is going to be harder if we place silver diamine fluoride on it. As I mentioned at the outset of this talk on incomplete caries removal, we have plan A and then we have plan B. We have what's planned in our kids, what we want to do, what's ideal to do, and then we have plan B, what is actually possible to do. And so incomplete caries removal is really nothing new, especially for pediatric patient management, because sometimes we get in there and we completely lose cooperation of the child and incomplete caries removal is all that we can clinically complete. The use of Revastar, the silver diamine and potassium give us the confidence and that security in that procedure of incomplete caries removal because now we have a caries arrest medicament that if we've got any type of caries left behind, we are going to have that confidence that it is then arrested. So with Revastar with S from SDI, we now have that tool it can effectively arrest caries. And now I'll move on to the definitive aesthetic restorations using a silver co-cure technique for the next uh, portion of my presentation. So a silver co-cure technique, a silver sandwich technique, perhaps we might call it. And that is the placement at the base of that restoration of silver diamine fluoride and potassium iodide to minimize the staining, followed by a layers of glass ionomer bond and a, a composite material. So a deep carious lesion, large lesion in a young or even a mature permanent tooth. And we are using this silver co-cure sandwich technique so that we do not have an exposure because who wants to sit through an exposure and an endo or a direct pulp cap if that's the way that you're gonna go if we don't have to. So this is using the positive attributes of glass ionomer, resin modified glass ionomer and composite. And by using this technique altogether, we actually will increase the bond strength of the materials. The co-cure rationale is that the dentin of the uh, carious lesion is replaced with glass ionomer. So the dentin of the tooth, I guess I should say, is replaced with glass ionomer and the enamel is replaced with composite. That gives the advantages and the strengths of both materials and minimizes the weakness of both materials and the bond strength is thereby increased. So the method for this is that we would etch for five seconds with phosphoric acid. Remember, if we're using phosphoric acid, we're allowing for a deeper penetration of our um, uh, of our silver diamine fluoride, of our Revastar and potassium iodide. Wash it and dry it, but don't desiccate it. We have a layer of pure glass ionomer on the floor of that base prep, and I'm not curing it. Then we have a layer bonding intermediary and don't cure it. And then we layer the composite and then we cure it all together. This is developed by Dr. Knight. This is the co-cure method, better, faster, and easier dentistry. And what I have done is I have added a silver layer to it. So at the base of that restoration, I'm not sure you can see my cursor or not, we have silver diamine fluoride and potassium iodide, the Arivastar that is touching the base of that um, cavitation where we have some, perhaps some, some leathery carious uh, dentin left behind, some caries that we want to arrest. So we layer the silver fluoride, then the potassium iodide, a chemical bond then ensues between the glass ionomer and the Revastar, and then a chemical bond. And this is our intermediary. So intermediary. So we have either, you have choices here. You can do a resin modified glass ionomer 
polymer like the Riva LC. You can do a Riva Bond LC, which is a glass ionomer bonding agent, or you can use a Zip Bond, which is a universal bonding agent, either or. If that's not clear, I'm going to go over several examples to make it clear. And then our final layer, our enamel like layer, is our composite. When we cure this, composite shrinks, and then we have a cascading effect of heat that has a uh, an effect that will have the expansion of the glass ionomer um, portions of it, and then we have a full cure. So once again, the very base layer is our Riva star, and then we have a sandwich that includes either the pure glass ionomer, the bonding agent, which is either your zip bond or your Riva bond LC here, and then a composite layer. And it doesn't have to be a flowable composite on that top layer. It can be a packable composite. It all depends on how much space you've got to fill in that lesion. Go through a clinical example with you. This is recurrent decay. There is a very deep lesion, a six-year molar, where we, you can see this is the old restoration that now needs to be replaced. This is radiographically, you can see that large, large lesion on that six-year molar, deep decay approximating the pulp. So we've gone in and removed the old uh, restoration and we see that very deep layer. So I don't want to have a pulp exposure for this kid. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter that whether we're awake or whether we're uh, in the operating room asleep, we still don't want to have a pulp exposure. So best ben benefit if, as I said, if we can use an acid etch, a total etch technique, wash it and dry it, but don't desiccate it. Placement of the silver. So this is the placement, the smart technique, silver modified atraumatic restorative technique, silver diamine fluoride being placed, the first step of that Riva star, place it for 60 seconds, followed by potassium iodide. You see that creamy precipitate and keep bathing that area with the potassium iodide until it turns clear. Then we want to give it a wash, but not desiccate it as we're drying it. Placement of our pure glass ionomer, self-cure glass ionomer, the Riva uh, self-cure is in a bulk. And then at this point, you're going to do a, one of two things. we got to bond this now to our composite. So we're either going to use zip bond, a universal adhesive, single component fluoride releasing universal adhesive, or we're going to use a Riva bond LC, which is a light cured resin reinforced glass ionomer bonding agent, either or. So you got you got your glass ionomer. I'm going back a step uh, for clarification. And then you bond it either with the zip bond or the Riva bond LC. Okay, Riva Bond LC, as I said, is a light cured adhesive. It's got a glass ionomer component. It's a really unique product and a, and a great, great product to use. In this case, I'm using the Riva Bond. Now, not only am I putting my Riva Bond onto my glass ionomer component, but I'm also putting it onto the enamel at the occlusal surface of that. Um, uh, preparation. And then we've got to place a composite layer. And so in this case, or an easy flow is a, would be a good choice, or an easy flow, really nice aesthetics, nice to use. You can use it for a liner or for a sealant or for a, a fill. And we're using it in this case uh, would be a good example to use it as a fill placement of that flowable and then we're going to light cure it all together. So we see virtually no staining at all with that combination. I'll show you one other uh, clinical case. Again, just to go over those steps, the base of this is going to be the Riva star. So the silver co-cure technique. So the base is the potassium, uh, the silver fluoride and potassium iodide, followed by your glass ionomer, a bonding intermediary, and then a composite type layer. 
So what we would do is we would go ahead. This is our um, this is our initial uh, situation, and this is a, a brand new case. I haven't shared this one uh, in a webinar. As of yet, this is the uh, deep carious lesion, the six-year molar, and gone and cleaned out uh, quite a lot of the decay, a, a case of hypomineralization, molar incisor hypomineralization. So we have an unhealthy tooth to begin with. And clean out as much as we can, no exposure. We wanna do a total etch on that tooth with phosphoric acid etch. We're gonna let that phosphoric acid etch at least five seconds on the dentin area, longer onto the enamel area. The first step after that is the silver, placement of the silver. Again, I don't think that I mentioned it, I know Ron did silver with a silver brush so it's completely dummy proof and for 60 seconds and then follow the potassium iodide and that's the green capsule with the green brush creamy precipitate until it turns clear followed by a placement of pure glass ionomer that is the Riva self-cure and then our bonding agent. So either the zip bond universal adhesive by SDI or the Riva bond LC, the glass ionomer adhesive, adhesive, either or, and I place it on and I kind of tap it down with that adhesive, follow it by the Aura Easy Flow in this case. And then we're going to cure that all together. Now, if you needed more strength on that uh, top layer, on that enamel replacement layer, what could we do other than a flowable? You can do lots of things. You can use uh, Aura. You can use, uh, this is an Aura bulk fill, one universal shade. It's got a high depth of cure without any need for a capping layer, great strength, easy to place, and it is packable and non-sticky. You can use that. Lots of other great composites from SDI as well, Luna, or the uh, aura in the different shades if you want to get really aesthetic. This is pediatric dentistry. Pediatric dentistry doesn't get too aesthetic at the best of times. So placement of our aura easy here and light cure and really minimal, minimal shine through uh, if any. And I have, uh, I have a few minutes left, I believe. I wanted to show you a uh, couple, I have, a, I have a, a procedure video as well, but I think that it's quite similar to, to Ron. So I'm going to just go over the beginning of that procedure video where there's a few differences. I wanted to share this with you where I have the armamentarium and the materials that you would need in order to do that uh, uh, silver co-cure method. So your potassium iodide and silver fluoride on the bottom of the screen here, that's your Revastar, the phosphoric acid etch, and then a Reva self-cure, which is the pure glass ionomer, one, your adhesive of choice, and then this is the Aura Easy Flow or the Aura, and of course the uh, light cure that you need, the Radii Expert, and the uh, uh, gun that you would use to um, to extrude your glass ionomer and then of course your uh, composite. Um, let's move on to just a couple other uses of silver fluoride and um, potassium iodide and how we would use them and this would be to use the silver diamine fluoride with a stainless steel crown. You have what's called a silver stainless steel crown. That's treatment of your tooth with silver diamine fluoride followed by a stainless steel crown. So again, a similar type of situation that I was talking about where we have a deep carious lesion uh, in a, this, in this case, another six-year molar, and I'm going to be placing a crown onto that tooth. I still don't want to have an exposure of the pulp, and so placement of the um, silver fluoride on that deepest of areas. And this is again that single 
bottle comes in very handy for this type of a situation because we can just use as much as we as we need for that one tooth placement of the silver on there that really turned uh, quite dark there from that silver and then placement of a stainless steel crown over top of that. And if any of you are familiar with the hall technique, uh, the hall technique was developed by a general practitioner in Scotland and identified during an audit of child dental care practice in Scotland. And uh, what she had done, Dr. Hall had done, was she cemented crowns over carious primary molars without any local anesthetic and no caries removal, no tooth preparation, and had been doing this since 1988. And this has been studied quite extensively since then and has found to have great validity. Now we tend to get a little nervous when we are putting any type of restoration over an incomplete caries removal, never mind no caries removal whatsoever. And so a great a compromise, not compromise, that's not the right word, a, a great um, solution to deal with the caries left behind is to place silver over top of the carious area and then do the hall technique. So we have, for example, a carious lesion here on the distal of the uh, first primary molar. This is an orthodontic separator place to make some room so we can place the hall technique. And what we would do is place that silver there. Silver's already been placed in this case. And this is just to show you the occlusion prior to the placement of the hall crown. And this is the placement of the stainless steel crown over top of that carious lesion that has been treated with silver fluoride. And you see that there is blanching of tissues. And uh, in this case here, we have of course a high occlusion. In about two weeks, we have the uh, tooth that has then, um, that has then uh, been uh, intruded into proper occlusion. So I think that I'm at about 40 minutes. And so you tell me, Lisa and Lou, do you want me to stop here? I have a video of a procedure that's pretty similar to what Ron showed, just a little different in the way that I cure my materials uh, as opposed to how Ron does his. Do you want me to share that video? Or do you want me to stop for some question and answer? Why don't we do some Q&A and then if we have time, we could show the video at the end. Sure. So Ron, if you would join. Carla, while Ron joins, let me ask you a couple questions. Sure. So, and again, thank you so much. It's great seeing you. And by the way, everybody, Carla lives in Winnipeg. Current temperature is 20 freaking below zero. <laughs> so I, that's all I can say, Carla. It's 20 below zero up there. Um, God bless you. So yeah, thanks. You know, I, I don't want to get into um products routinely but reva a bond like cure you know it's a as you talked about it it's a kind of a reinforced bonding agent glass ionomer right. and it's really new to most people so could you basically let me ask you this could you etch a tooth use reva bond lc and then just go to a composite absolutely Absolutely. So, so go ahead. Yeah. So I don't know. Can you still see my screen? Yes. Okay. So this is this is the the photo of the Riva Bond LC, and and so it's it's a, a light cured adhesive, like like most of the adhesives that we are familiar with. Right. The difference is that it's got a glass ionomer component to it, and the handling of it feels different than a traditional resin adhesive because it's it's got more viscosity to it. It feels thicker. So it feels a little bit out of our you know, usual paradigm, our usual comfort zone, if you wanna call it that when we use it, but absolutely you can use this at the base of a composite uh, restoration for sure. So just cause I have this at my office and a lot of people have seen this. So you etch a tooth, rinse, and you, you triturate for 10 seconds, correct? Right. right. And, and then you open it and then you apply it like a scrubbing for 20 seconds. Yeah, so this is this is the same principles as the Riva 
self-cure and the Riva light cure that we are using in these procedures that we're talking about, where you have a capsule, if you can see the very bottom of that screen right. under the word fluoride, where you would depress the plunger the same way that you depress the plunger on our glass ionomer capsules and you triturate it. And then it's got a little foil and you pierce through that foil and then you uh, you have your your material in in that. You stick your micro brush in. You scrub it on, and and you you will uh, like cure it. So you do it. Do you air dry to remove the solvent like a typical bonding agent? I, I will put a stream of air onto it. Yes. Okay, and then light curing is a normal ten to twenty seconds. Yeah, ten seconds. Okay, great. I think it's a unique product, and it, is. it would be interesting. And I, I I'll follow up with SDI uh, to see bond strings, but it's in my office and I think that has a, a lot of really cool uniqueness. Another yeah. thing you and Ron both talked about tonight, and I think it's important for everybody here, is less drilling is better. And the studies go back 40 years about, you don't have to remove all the carries in a preparation. So for me, Carla, if I leave carries on the on the pulpal floor, so to speak, I want to make clear that I believe you have to remove the carries along all your line angles, along your axial walls, because yeah. Ron said it, you have to create a biologic seal yeah. and you won't do that if you leave carries on the walls. Your thoughts? Yeah, no, you're absolutely 100% right. You have to have a, a good seal. You have to have clean margins. The success of this and almost any other type of restoration, if not any type of restoration that we're going to be placing intraorally depends upon clean margins and a seal. You have to have that. Without that, you're going to have certain failure. I, okay. Ron, any comments to that or just agree? Totally agree. Okay. So... I, I just think for everybody, a key point is when you leave here tonight, we're not saying, saying to leave gross carries. If you leave carries on the gingival floor, the studies for 40 years have shown you can still seal it. Okay. So Carla, so, some, I, I just want to get to specific questions, then we'll get right back to Ron. Uh, are there any clinical studies, this is from Ryan, that showing that having a layer of silver is superior to a glass ionomer and a composite open or closed sandwich. I think Ron answered this, but by having the silver layer down, is it a superior dentin seal, so to speak? Well, Your thoughts? you know, I, I think the, the real question, it, there's plenty of literature out there, pediatric dentistry wise, talking about the benefits of silver diamine fluoride as a medicament and the periodicity of, and the literature is telling us that the benefit of placing the silver diamine fluoride is very high. So, you know, what, what is the real question? Are you looking at an effective restoration? Are you looking right. at what, what creates an effective restoration when we have incomplete caries removal? Are you looking at what creates an ideal bond to the dentin? You know, there's many factors to, to that question. And I think that it, the answer depends upon what your clinical situation is. So what is it that you are restoring? Are you restoring an absolutely clean preparation? Then we, do we need to put silver diamine fluoride at the base of it or do we? not need to put silver diamond fluoride. And, you know, sometimes even when we look at something clinically, uh, if, if we think that it's caries free, is it truly caries free? And the silver diamond fluoride is only going to stain an area that's exactly. got caries, right? So, you know, you use products like, what, what was it called? Snoop, where, you know, it's like a caries dye. The silver diamine fluoride can almost act like a caries dye while it's arresting the carious area. So I think that I digressed like a lot from the answer to that question. But you know, what what is the best thing to do depends upon what the clinical situation is. If there was one single answer to what the best thing to do was, we'd only have one material to restore with. Right. And, and Carla, I, I think you just did a home run. I think if 
if I'm in the chair and I've got a deepish lesion, I would want you on my tooth to pop open Revastar, use the silver, scrub it for 60 seconds. And if there's any remaining caries, just neutralize it, put on your potassium iodide, put your glass ionomer over it. Yeah. And the reason I'll say this is I've been practicing longer than both of you. And when I see, I take out a 20 year old composite with a base of glass ionomer, I'll see recurrent decay oftentimes around a composite. You take it out and you get to your glass ionomer and there's no decay. And, and I think that's the virtue of what we're talking about. How do we keep teeth for 50 years? And it's not just simple composite dentistry. And, I, and I, I think you're right on, Carla. So Matthew commented, Carla, about one of your presentations. And he says, I'm not sure how atraumatic this case is. It was when you were taking out carries on your new presentation case. You said, look how, he says, look how deep the lesion is. He says, my understanding of a smart technique was there's no prep. You just hand instrument, a little low speed drilling, followed by SDF and glass ionomer. Yeah, you, yeah, you're, you're right. A traumatic restorative technique, and then there's intermediate restorative technique. And, you know, truly, is it a true a traumatic restorative technique? Mm, probably not. This is a silver modified a traumatic restorative technique. So can we use this though? And I, and I do have plenty of of cases showing an, a, a true atraumatic restorative technique with silver fluoride where you're not re removing anything. And, and that's really for the kids that, that we cannot get in and, and do anything more for. You know, we can't get in there with a drill. We can't anesthetize the kid. Uh, so, so is this possible to use on that kid? Yes, it absolutely is possible. Was that case a, a kid where we removed nothing? No, because we know that we're going to have better success if we can remove some and create that, that good seal. And, and I think to the point, Matthew, it's case dependent. If yeah. I'm working on a geriatric patient that is very difficult control due to Alzheimer's and stuff, I will use a SMART technique. They're old. I really don't want to drill much, and I, I just want to get in and out as fast as possible. It's, it's really case by case dependent. On the other hand, Carla, if I'm working on a 30-year-old individual and I've got deep carries, I don't want to use a glass ionomer on a large occlusal because I know it'll wear, right. so I want to composite. So I think, Matthew, you just have to realize it's case by case dependent. Correct, Carla? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I'll get to you, Rob, but these are all Carla questions you've had. Good. Okay. So Carla, Angela asks, and, and I'm going to, I got to understand this because Ron and I kind of do it our way. That doesn't mean, and probably Ron and I are wrong. Okay. Once the pure glass ionomer is placed, you are dabbing your bonding agent onto a wet glass ionomer. Or are you waiting until Lou and Ron wait for the glass ionomer to harden and then place the bonding agent? I'm not waiting. I'm placing it onto the unset glass ionomer. And then I'm placing the composite or the flowable directly on top and I'm curing them as a co-cure technique. So right. That's, then that's that cascading technique. And that, that again, that's a, that's a Dr. Knight uh, takeaway. And, and so I, right. And so everybody on here, and it goes back to Matthew with a smart technique or not, nobody's got one answer. So these are just different techniques. And Jeff Knight, who's taught all of us out of Australia, that's how he's done it. And Carla's applied it in her practice. So Carla, the next question from Daphna is, if trying to be atraumatic in an uncooperative child, how can we etch, won't it be too sensitive? You know, so, so, you know, that's, a, that's an excellent question. If I got an uncooperative kid, I can't etch. Right. And, and you, we know that the, we know that the placement, that we know that the penetration of the silver is greater if we can etch. That's been, that's been proven. The evidence is there. If I can etch and get that penetration deeper of the silver, I etch. If I got an uncooperative kid, I'm not etching. I'm just placing the silver. 
Okay, so again, Leo, back to the to your comment a, a few seconds ago, case by case, we got to do what is best for that kid and best for, or person and best for that particular situation. Great. You know, there, there's there's the ideal, and then there's there's what what is possible. Agreed. So we have two questions about when you're near the bulb. So Evan asks, can you comment on the safety? of a five second etch and SDF close to the pulp. Lots of reports of SDF uh, best the pulp create pulping the pulp necrosis. Yeah. I'll let Carla talk and then Ron if you'd follow up. So I'm I'm glad I'm glad you you brought this up because I wanted to I wanted to bring it up a couple of questions ago and I'm glad you got to it now. So so we don't want SDF on the pulp. If we are that close to the pulp that you think that that SDF is gonna to penetrate to the pulp, it's gonna cause necrosis. So I'm not doing Revastar, silver diamond fluoride or any other you know, silver fluoride products on a pulp exposure or a near pulp exposure. You talked about Theracal when we were talking with Ron. So today, a few hours ago before I was here, I was, when I was working and I had a big lesion on a six year molar and I had my stuff out, I had the Revastar out, I'm gonna do the Revastar on this particular kid so that I don't have an exposure and I'm cleaning it up and cleaning it up and I'm like, oh, this is, this is too deep. This is not a Revastar kid, this is a Theracal LC kid. So I'm that close to the pulp don't put your silver fluoride on it. And it's clinical judgment, right? You're looking at the radiograph, you're looking clinically, you're looking, you're asking symptomatically, historically, all of these things together are going to combine to make your judgment call on whether we're treating that deep lesion as an incomplete caries removal with some Revastar or whether we're too close and we need to treat it at, with something like Theracal LC and the calcium silicate materials that we have from uh, Bisco in order to not have a symptomatic tooth. Because ultimately we don't wanna have a symptomatic tooth, right? We wanna do what is right for that particular patient. And all the clinical scenarios are different. So to, the short answer to that question is, you don't want the silver on the pulp or near the pulp of the tooth. How close are you? Are you? That's the you know that's always been our crystal ball question. How much caries do we remove before it's too late, right? How far do we have to be, and how can you clinically tell how far you are? And that's the judgment call that you base upon clinical, radiographic, symptomatic, historical question to the patient, parent, etc. Ron, any comments on that? I mean, so I totally agree with Carla. I think for me, if I don't see that pinkish hue through the dentin, I'm going to go ahead and apply Reva Star most of the time. If I see that pinkish hue, I'm going to switch to um, Theracal for sure. And at the end of the day, the goal here is to minimize the need for root canal. Right. And here's where communication comes in. We, we can't eliminate root canals. We can minimize the need using the technologies that we have, and we use our clinical judgment, apply the right material appropriately, and then the tooth's got to heal. My analogy that I use is that if you cut your finger and you place sutures in, well, the finger's going to hurt for a while, even after while those sutures are healing. These materials have to go through a healing process. Hopefully, the sensitivity is eliminated right away but it doesn't mean you're gonna not end up with a non-vital pulp. And, and while our goal is to get there, um, we use our clinical judgment in the hopes that we are applying the right material at the right time. And we need to have an arsenal of these materials in our practice so we can choose the appropriate material in the appropriate situation. Great. Um, Carla, what cement do you use was asked, this will be our last question, or I think it will be, I'm trying my best. What do you use to cement your stainless steel crowns? Oh, resin modified glass ionomer. There you go. Um, and then it says, why phosphoric etch and not a mirror? This is funny, Ron, we talked about this earlier. 
from Ryan. Why, why do you etch with a phosphoric etch and not a mild glass ionomer condition? Are we trying to remove the smear layer or demineralize the dentin? You guys want to take it? Here, wait. Let me put my slide up and then Ron can talk over it. You go, no, go. There you go. That's why. You want to open those tubules. Right. Yeah. So, you know, to that, Lou, I mean, I'm, I'm going to, during the, while Caller was speaking, I did a little research on the cement question. And there are a couple of studies that show, um, this is to, uh, let me get his name so I get the right name. Right. This is to Bernardino's question about cementation. Uh, there are enough studies, there are a few out there now that show that if you're using Riva Star and using an RMGI cement, the resin will interact with the Riva Star in a non-positive way. So you got to really be, the, I think the, the take takeaway of that is that if you're using any kind of resin, whether it's a cement or restorative with Riva Star, and resin is what's hitting that dentin, I think you got to be careful. Yeah, a great point. I just want to say, I know it's 10 o'clock and Lisa's going to come on at 10 o'clock Eastern. Carla, um, I hope that dog can keep you warm at 20 degrees below zero. Ron, it's great having you. Uh, this has been a really great cohesive night of understanding Reba Star. We had a ton of great questions and over 300 participants. Catapult Education, thanks everybody. Let's close our wonderful night together.